It was argued that on the assumption that the results of works get destroyed even before being experienced, the purport of the scripture will be distorted. But that creates no difficulty, for we do not mean to deny the power of works to produce their results. That remains just as it is. But we assert that this power is arrested by other factors like knowledge, etc. The scripture is committed to the existence of the power of work but not to the existence or non-existence of opposing factors. Besides, the Smriti text, for the results of work are not destroyed, is only a general rule. For the potential result of work does not get destroyed except through experience, inasmuch as it is meant for that. As a matter of fact, it is desired that sin should be dissipated by expiation, etc., as it is stated in such Vedic and Smriti texts as he gets over all sins. A performer of the Asha made a sacrifice, as also a man possessed of this knowledge, gets over the sin of killing a Brahmana. Taitriya Aranyaka 5, 3, 12, 1. And it was said that the expiatory rites are to be classed with the occasional rites, occasioned by certain circumstances, and hence that they cannot wash away the sins. But that is wrong. Since the expiatory rites are prescribed in connection with certain commissions, they may well have the destruction of the resulting sins as their effect. And hence it is improper to infer some unseen potency for them, as in the case of occasional rites. Again, it was argued that unlike expiatory rites, knowledge is not enjoined for dissipating sins. With regards to this, we say, in the case of meditations on the qualified Brahman, such injunctions are surely in evidence. And in the complementary portion of these, it is stated that the meditator gets superhuman powers and cessation of sin as his reward. Since there is nothing to show that these two results are not intended to be indicated, it can be ascertained that those meditations lead to the acquisition of divine powers after the eradication of sins. But as regards contemplation on the absolute Brahman, though there be no such prescription, still it can be concluded that the burning away of the results of past karma is the effect of the realization that the self is free from all actions. By the term non-attachment, the aphorist implies that the knower of Brahman has no idea of agentship whatsoever with regard to the actions occurring in future although the man of knowledge appeared to have some ownership of the past works on account of false ignorance. Still, owing to the cessation of false ignorance through the power of knowledge, those works also are washed away. This fact is stated by the term destruction. The knower of Brahman has this realization. As opposed to the entity known before as possessed of agentship and experiencership by its very nature, I am Brahman, which is by nature devoid of agentship and experiencership in all the three periods of time. Even earlier, I was never an agent and experiencer, nor am I so at present, nor shall I be so in future. From such a point of view alone can liberation be justified. For, on a contrary supposition, if the results of works flowing down from eternity continue unhampered in their course, there can be no liberation. Besides, liberation, unlike the results of work, cannot be produced by a concurrence of place, time, and causation, since that would make it impermanent. It is also unreasonable that the result of knowledge, which is really immediate, should be mediate, as the opponent's theory implies. Hence the conclusion is that sin becomes dissipated when Brahman is known. Namaste. 
So, in this part of the Adhikarana, Shankaracharya systematically demolishes <laughs> the opponent's arguments because the scripture has already declared the truth that if you realize Brahman, that's the end of karma, both bad or sinful and good or pious. And that will be uh, emphasized in the next Adhikarana. But in this one, we have to see that, you know, these arguments, although they're thousands of years old, they certainly reflect viewpoints of a lot of people in the world today. Isn't it? Like he's saying that, well, it doesn't matter if you do any expiatory rituals. It doesn't matter if you make offerings for redemption from sin. You know, all these things don't matter uh, because you're an eternal being and you have no connection with sin or virtue anyway. But then Shankaracharya destroys that. And he says, no, the expiatory rites have a function, which is that to cleanse one's karma to the point where one can realize Brahman. So karma is going to be there until what happens? One lets go of the idea of being the agent. Now, agency is a philosophical term that basically means cause, causation, causing things to happen, being the doer, in other words. So Shankaracharya categorically uh, denies agentship for the self in all the three periods of time. Yes, even though before enlightenment, there is the impression that this being is an agent and a possessor and an enjoyer of material objects. Still, because this is an illusion, it's only name and form. It's not the reality. The empirical self, the individual self, is neither the owner nor the cause nor the enjoyer of phenomena. That is the Lord alone. So, Brahman alone is everything. And in the Saguna Brahman, with qualities, he is everything and does everything, knows everything, and enjoys everything. Because that's his constitutional position. And what is ours? To serve him, to worship him, to love him, to learn about him, become familiar with him, and develop affection for him by hearing his glories. So we can visualize Brahman in any divine form. And he can also reveal himself in any kind of divine form uh, to the inner being. And this is called Ishta Devata, that one realizes the specific form, the name and form of the Godhead that really one could love forever. Uh, the the pieces, the puzzle pieces match so perfectly that my taste is his taste and his taste is my taste. And, you know, he loves us unconditionally. You know, he or and or she. <laughs> well, I'm not ashamed to say that I have several of these relationships with several different forms of God. And although one is, you know, more important than all the others to me, still, they are there, you know, in different moods. Neutrality, servitorship, parenthood, conjugal love, friendship, you know. These are all mellows, rasas, tastes of transcendental love that are exchanged between the Lord and the devotee. And there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, 
This is the goal, the realization into Saguna Brahman, Brahmaloka, the spiritual world within the material world, is certainly the most important step one can make on the path of complete self-realization. But, you know, still the final realization of Nirguna Brahman is waiting there. And no later than the dissolution of this cosmic manifestation, all the beings in Brahma Loka will merge with Nirguna Brahman. That's really the end, folks. <laughs> but if before that one realizes Nirguna Brahma, well, that's fine too. The Jivan Mukta, the realized being, has immense freedom precisely because his actions do not result in the creation of good or bad karma. So anything he may do, for example, for the cause of dharma, for the cause of enlightening others, for the cause of spreading this knowledge, Brahma Vidya, one who has this knowledge is absolved from all sin. That's the message of this Adhikarana. And that's the message of all scriptures, isn't it? Of all religions. That we should fear not God, but the sins that cause the negative karmic reactions. So if we stop committing those sins, if we uh, no longer go against the will of God, but instead cooperate with God, to serve his interests, his desires, you know, his and or her <laughs> desires through any process of religion. The uh, Brahma Sutra is quite clear on this, that all the different forms of meditation on God have in the long run the exact same result, which is realization of Nirguna Brahma. So, one should perform sadhana in any mode, doesn't matter, according to one's own preferences, according to one's own taste. And this will slowly at first, and then faster and faster, huh? it's an exponential or maybe a double exponential curve. One feels absolved and rid of the burden of the past sinful activities and comes to enjoy simply being. You know, this is very hard for uh, unexperienced people to understand. But if one is even a little bit experienced, he can understand. When you go to the temple, or when you chant a mantra, when you make an offering to the deities, like here, like I showed in the beginning, when you spread this message of liberation and absolution from sin and the attainment of perfections like Brahman realization, then certainly because one is acting on the behalf of God, then the mercy of God, Anugraha, the blessing of God is certainly available in great abundance. Om Tat Sat, Om Shakti Om, Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>